Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to Read Initiative. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and today I am honored to have Lynn Stone from Australia join me for a fourth time, and we have talked about her journey in episode one. We have talked about her thoughts about reading in episode two. Episode three has been her thoughts about spelling, and today we are talking about her thoughts about writing. Now, Lynn has some amazing books and courses and resources on these various concepts. And you're in the process of doing one about writing. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to get it. I've, I've, I've written it. Um, and there's a course that, you know, that, that, uh, that can be done on it. I just haven't had it published yet because things, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, so on, yeah, I've got a, I've, I've got a, um, a grammar and syntax book that needs its second edition done. Mm -hmm. So I have to put that there first, and that's going to take me until Easter next year, and then writing for life will uh, hit the shelves. And when I say hit the shelves, I mean <laughs> it's going to be ages because publishing is such a slow process. But you know, it'll be out at some point in the future. Well, for those that are interested, I've started your writing course and it's amazing and the resources are wonderful. Um, and it's definitely given me some food for thought for starting our discussion today. And I think it's really important that we start with the basics and how we can set kids up for success with the mechanics of writing. And you and I, neither of us are occupational therapists or physiotherapists, but I'm sure with the number of students and individuals that we've worked with that have had poor posture, poor penmanship, we've learned a few things. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in your eyes, well, why don't we start with, you had a, a rhyme that was like one, two, three, four. It's not mine. I okay. it's totally stolen um, okay. from a from a school. I did not invent that definitely, but it's very cool. It's yeah. a little check in and it's and it's easy to say and remember. And what that does with writing, it's it's like an accretion, right? It's like a putting layers of varnish onto mm -hmm. something. It's not until you know the hundredth layer or whatever that you've actually got some thickness there. So that's mm -hmm. a, a, an accretive process. So writing is small, um, high quality actions over time that's what mm -hmm. develops a writing brain and uh, and you know a, a writer um and one of those those things that's sometimes neglected is posture and and pencil grip we have a really busy curriculum and teachers sometimes will sort of overlook that because they're so busy doing everything else so this this um this rhyme uh was something that i actually don't know who coined it but it goes one, two, three, four, are your feet on the floor? Because it's really important to have this great posture when you're, when you're writing, especially when you're little. Five, six, seven, eight is your back nice and straight because you've got this really heavy head with a brain in it. And if your back's not straight, what that does is that it pulls onto the, on the, the nerves and muscles of your shoulders, your lower back and so on. And, and it, it doesn't create this strong core or help to create or reinforce this strong core for writing. So, um, and then nine, 10, 11, 12, this is how your pencil's held. So just a little bunch of rhymes like that as a check-in before you start writing makes a difference over time. It means I'm conscious of it and you students need to be conscious of this. This is very important. So that's what that's for. <laughs> Yeah, well, and one thing that we've seen globally is that the fine motor scores or scales required for penmanship aren't what they used to be in our, our kindergarten students. I know one of my own children going into kindergarten has about, you know, three or four different grips, and they're not all using a pincer. Some of them are like this, and some of them are like this. And it's important in those first few months to really be conscious of what we're asking the students to do to get that proper grip and to develop the muscles so that they have the stamina. Yeah, to longer the stamina, absolutely. The stamina and the automaticity because there are two sides to writing mm -hmm. and we need certain parts of it. We need the mechanics and the conventions of writing to become increasingly automatic, just mm -hmm. as in the simple view of reading, we want decoding to become increasingly automatic and word recognition and so on to become increasingly automatic. Well, it's the same with the mechanics and conventions of writing. It needs to become increasingly automatic so that 
cognitive real estate can get freed up to become increasingly strategic at text generation at that other side of the, um, you know, um, the, the writing process. So if they are, uh, if they're uncomfortable, that's going to take up a slot in their working memory. And working memory, everything in writing is mediated by attention and working memory, according to the research of Virginia Berninger, who I strongly, strongly advise everybody to read as much of as possible. When I was doing my research on, on um, the book and the course and, and so on, Berninger's name is the one that came up over and over again. Virginia Berninger is like the oft quoted, you know, um, sort of head of all of this. And, um, you know, like when you look, when you look uh, into reading, you'll see things like Profetti, Kilpatrick, the same names, Berninger, right, for writing. So, you know, um, in, 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 um, uh, in her view and, uh, and in the views of many of the other researchers who have replicated or have carried her work um, forward, um, you know, we, we, we need to media, sorry, working memory and attention, mediate this very, very difficult thing. So if we're, if we're filling their working memory and taking their attention, off onto how uncomfortable their body is and what we're going to do is get a, an inferior result mm -hmm. it's it really it's very very logical yeah and we want the actual letter formation itself to reach that automaticity so they don't have to stop okay how do i make that letter and then having it so it's not like a discovery based process for how to write the letters it's very important to go top down left right in letter formation because it's a more fluid motion and it makes it the speed increase right when they can do it just do it without thinking about it we really want them to be able to do that i know one of the things that i do with any new student that i get is i get them to sit down with a piece of paper print their name and the alphabet and see how long that takes because that can tell me a lot of things with just that simple task even if they're in high school. Yeah, absolutely. Like there, I, in my view, there's no greater test than a spelling test because a spelling test will tell you, give you so much insight into the, the, the abilities of the students that you have. And that includes handwriting. What we want with handwriting is speed and legibility and one without the other is, is useless. So you can write really legibly, but if you're very, very slow, <laughs> if you're taking a lot of time because you're not automatic at your letter formation and all of your energy is going into making these, you know, beautiful letters, mm -hmm. then you're not going to become anything like a writer that you of, of the standard that you need to be to pursue an academic career. Even and I'm talking when I say academic career, I mean high school. Mm -hmm. Right. That's, that's what I mean. I don't even mean beyond that. Um, it's the same with speed. Uh, sorry, it's the same with legibility. You can write really fast, but if no one can read what you're writing, there's no point. So, <laughs> you know, again, speed and legibility. And as you mentioned before, penmanship mm. are important aspects of, of development. We need to develop these things in primary school um, to give them a, the best chance that they possibly can get um, in many areas, not just high school, but in, in society in general. That's true. And uh, one thing that I learned at university, you know, within my first few weeks, uh, we were told about the happy marker rule. This is not something that I was taught in elementary school, but if the marker is happy, they're more likely to find those extra marks mm. and spend the time giving you the benefit of the doubt. But if they are struggling to read your assignment and understand what you're saying or trying to communicate, they're like, yeah, no, I don't know. I'm not going to try. And there actually have been studies um, where or instances where a student that has perfectly legible, really neat writing uh, copied out the same paper as a student who had poor penmanship and they got an A plus, whereas the other person got a D and it was the exact same teacher with the exact same assignment, but they didn't spend the time to look deeper into the assignment. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. You know, first impressions count. I mean, with writing, there are so many different aspects to it there are so many tiny differences mm -hmm. that you can make over time and viewed individually it may seem that any focus on any of those components is insignificant but actually adding them up over time you have a very very significant difference the a plus to the d you know mm -hmm. that's a significant significant difference with all of the factors that are involved in writing so it's my argument that we shift i know this is the right to read project and so on right mm -hmm. but 
need to shift yes. our focus as teachers um, and primary teachers over from reading to writing. Just a small shift will make a huge difference in my view. I mean, that's my view, uh, but all evidence points to that. Um, you know, so I, again, I've been a very strong advocate for we need, we, we can't just, we've got reading, we're doing it well, <laughs> but <laughs> there's this other thing and it's not, one does not follow from the other. So, you know, if you, if you teach children to, um, to write well and you focus on that, two things happen. They learn to write well or mm -hmm. they improve their writing, but their reading improves as well. If mm -hmm. you only focus on reading, their reading will improve. The writing one, it doesn't follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Different things, you know, different things entirely. And I think that needs to be a strong message in, 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 uh, in the circles that we move in. Yeah, well, and, you know, printing and cursive, doing that and writing the words physically, that actual motor skill of writing it down is going to help improve the orthographic mapping. And just you know, taking a child and saying, oh, you know, it's, it's hard for you. You maybe have dysgraphia or um, a developmental um, coordination disorder or something like that. We're just going to give you an iPad. Well, that's really doing the student a disservice. Yeah. Yes, it's going to make easy, it easier for you, but it's not going to help their orthographic mapping. And what are they going to do in situations where that assistive technology is not available to them? Yeah, anything that increases a student's dependence on something outside that student has pitfalls. It has pitfalls. I'm not saying that we don't use assistive technology, no, but hand in hand with being able to function in a complex society, independent of other people, mm -hmm. that's where we. That's where that's what we've got to aim for. There are man, too many cases of adults who form, you know, destructive relationships or relationships that they don't need to be in. Mm -hmm. um, because they depend on others to do their reading and writing for them and writing especially. We can at least give the gift, gift of that independent, at least give the gift of that independence if we possibly can. But that doesn't mean that in an exam situation where there's time pressure and importance or quality using you know, the use of a computer, that's, we're not saying that. No, no. learning the field is really <laughs> important. Yes. But so is independence and, and that's a tightrope. We, we, we need to make sure that there's a very, high quality balance between those two things. I love assistive tech. I mm -hmm. think it's fabulous. And I love reasonable accommodations. That's mm -hmm. that's exactly, you know, that's a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's not to replace yeah. the ability to be independent of others. Yeah. Now, a common thing that we see in our, our primary schools is the use of little whiteboards and whiteboard markers. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could just take a few minutes to discuss your thoughts on them and how they, they do have a place, but they're not the only thing that we should be using, especially when we look at the size of the whiteboard markers that these kids are asked to use. Yeah, and there's another factor there as well. I mean, it's all, the, the answer is there's a time and a place for all of that. Um, but um, there's another factor with whiteboards as well. A lot of the whiteboard work that I see happening, many whiteboard work, cross-legged on the floor, right? So mm -hmm. you see that a lot in primary school. Um, and that in itself is a minefield of incorrect posture, discomfort, working memory being overloaded, um, you know, uh, just not an ideal writing situation at all. I love many whiteboards for the whole, you know, um, daily review. What's the, you know, what's, a, what's a, the, what does the letter C look like? Or, you know, what is the, what is the, um, the, the, the graphene for the sound? Shh chin it right that's this is great in checking for understanding absolutely wonderful but when you are coming to the task of writing pencil on paper mm -hmm. sitting up <laughs> sitting up straight looking at your teacher is going to give you more bang for your buck over time than anything else so again it's about that little shift and it's harder it's more fiddly isn't it you know, many whiteboards, everyone loves a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker and so on. Um, I, I get it. I get the convenience of it. But we have to, with writing, think about those layers over time of high quality practice and whiteboards are not it. One. And the other thing that I feel is missing from the whiteboards is the lines and the guidance. Yeah. For, for I, I mean, I, look, I, I even see just, just this concept of lines, Catherine, right? I, I see uh, 
writing samples um, from teachers all over social media on blank paper yeah. with kids writing going up and down like this not acceptable that is not acceptable there has to be meta language for where your letters sit yeah. you know there has to be you again you look at look at the adult experience yeah mm -hmm. the notebooks that people spend money on you know to write you've got them lined or they are dotted i, I love the dot ones. Like guides yeah why don't you take them away from a kid yeah you know when i when i go when i go and do a pd when i go and do a you know a talk uh like a whole day workshop or whatever yeah. they're not choosing to sit on the floor with many whiteboards to take their notes are they because people don't like to write like that like take a leaf out of your own book adults <laughs> get the lines there give them some guidance give them some meta language i'm getting excited sorry <laughs> <laughs> well and i think it's important to have lines from the start because then when you give them a lined sheet of paper and they're expected to do these tiny letters on lines, we don't want to make that huge jump Yeah. from, okay, well, where, where's the uppercase letter go and the lowercase letter. And that's another pet peeve that I have. I don't know if it's something that you're uh, experiencing, but yeah. I will have students in, you know, grades two, three, four, not know the difference between a capital and a lowercase letter. And, you know, we need to make sure that the teaching is explicit because yes, there are students in the class that will figure it out on their own, but Absolutely. we need to have the instruction for the students who don't. Absolutely. Look, if you subscribe to this idea of biologically primary and biologically secondary, Mm -hmm. right so biologically primary things that you're kind of driven to do through your instincts you know like pulling yourself up on the furniture and taking your first steps and learning the language um, of the, the the people around you and so on this is primary this is all stuff that children typically developing children are driven to do without anybody going hey let's take you to walking school or talking school right mm -hmm. but then there's also this concept of biologically secondary things for which we have the abilities but they're not innate we have to be taught them mm -hmm. In terms of biologically primary and biologically secondary, one of the most biologically secondary things that you can do is writing, right? It is at the apex of human endeavor. You have to be able to do so many other things in order to have your writing understood, right? So anything that's biologically secondary benefits from explicit instruction. Yes, you're gonna get those kids that, that just are gonna discover their way to it. Lovely, I love them but they also benefit right, from explicit instruction in this. Everyone can improve and some will not make it. They will not make it to the development of biologically secondary skills unless they are explicitly taught. The jury's not out on that anymore. So you know, it, it just, it's so logical to make it a big part of the curriculum, especially in primary school. Yeah. So I think we've covered the actual mechanics of writing quite well, but then you don't expect students to write this large essay right off the go. We need to start at the basics. After we go from letter formation, we need to learn about writing words and the appropriate spacing between words. So, you know, typically we start off with teaching students spelling, right? And we did a whole episode on that on your thoughts about spelling, but there is a place for in the writing so students understand the concept of spelling. Mm. And can you give us just a, a quick elevator speech on spelling? What is the process that we're doing in it? And how does it help our students orthographically map the word? So making it so that they have that instantaneous recognition of a word when they're reading and when they're writing it. Mm. Well, look, if you, if you look at it like this, um, the thing that makes a word, that word, right? And not any of the other words, right, in the language is the unique sequence of letters in that word, right? And there's 26 of those in the alphabet. So a combination of those 26 in a specific sequence will distinguish one word from all the other words, right? So that sequence is really important. Now, spelling is all about knowing what the appropriate sequence is, what the allowable sequences are. Yep, how they, how the sequences of those letters relate to sounds in the spoken word, 
And that relationship is not a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So there are other parts about that sequence that children need to know. So if you are going to have someone who is fast and legible, right? Legible doesn't just mean letter formation. It also means the correct sequence of letters so that your reader is not trying to figure out what it is that you meant. And that in a nutshell is spelling for writing, right? Being able to do that, practicing that, knowing how that system works, going from simple to complex is something that will create um, instant words for words for instant retrieval in long-term memory. And any approach that it, it doesn't, you know, sort of have a, a view on the system and how that system works is going to be, it's going to cause deficits in retrieval mm -hmm. of words from long-term memory. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, they, they're intertwined, spelling and writing are intertwined. And the easier you make it for kids, the better the writer you're going to produce. Um, and shouldn't that be the goal of, of school? I mean, surely. Yeah, and to highlight its importance, I, I can think of an example um, as a student that struggled with spelling. Uh, you know, you're in those situations where the teacher is dictating a sentence to you to write down, or you're copying something down from the board in your notebook. And the amount of working memory that it takes to hold that information in your head while you're trying to figure out how to spell one of the words. Well, in that moment, when you're trying to figure out how to spell, um, I don't know, assignment, and you can't remember how to spell assignment, well, you're forgetting the rest of that other part. So you have to go back, look at it again, or say, okay, well, I totally lost that. What, what did someone else say? And you're using up time and space in your working memory. So developing this automaticity is really important in understanding the orthography of English, yep. right? Absolutely. Then the next thing to learn is how to put these words together. And formal writing is a lot different than everyday conversation. We have rules about grammar and syntax. And again, it's one of those things that's biologically secondary. So you can't assume that students are gonna pick this up. Now, the beauty is when we work on teaching them about the syntax and the semantics and the grammar and the punctuation and the rules, um, that's going to help them with their reading comprehension. Yeah. So. <laughs> Can't say it better, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when we're starting out with our, with our littles, just teaching them about what a sentence is. What things are the things that we should be highlighting to them? Is it more than just the cops, the capitalization, overall appearance, punctuation, and spelling? Cops is a good check. It's yeah. a good, I, I, I've yet to meet a kid that kind of, you know, does that voluntarily. Um, do you know what I mean? Because, look, it's, it's not a bad editing tool. I'm not, I'm not going to no. denigrate it. Um, but, um, but, yeah, look... Um, I think one of the things to highlight, and I think this is also a teacher thing because I don't know if it is actually um, really well known in teacher circles and I'd like it to be really well known in teacher circles, but it's this, mm -hmm. text, right? Text in books, text that you write in order to respond to something that you're learning, even stories, that is not speech written down. It's not speech. It's a different form of language and it has a different system. There are definite points of overlap, especially at the sub word level, but any form of text has to be in complete sentences, unlike speech, which can be, you know, individual words, phrases here and there, right? Accompanied by gesture, all that sort of thing. Text is one form of language that requires complete sentences. So why? on earth <laughs> wouldn't you tell a kid from the beginning that if you want to communicate something written down you got to have a thing and you got to have the be do have of the thing right mm -hmm. that's complete that's that's how humans communicate and you know in other words subject and verb, subject and predicate but you know well I'll 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 go with verb at first right <laughs> I'm happy to do that 
Um, yeah, and you can do that. You can do that from the moment you start reading stories to kids. I right? think you can do that from that moment. You can go, hey, this story was about a thing, and that thing did something, was something, or had something. You've got a subject and verb there. Did you know that? Wow. When you write down, you've got to make sure you include those elements. It's not hard. It's not hard. You know, but teachers don't, again, and I'm not denigrating teachers, teachers don't get given this information in their training. Mm -hmm. And this is their intellectual property. This is this is what they should know. And they don't, they don't get it. They don't, I mean, they don't get given it, I should say. They have to go out and seek this information for themselves, which is a scandal in itself. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there are so many dead ends and wrong turns and misinformation out there. And, you know, I, the reason why I have the Right to Read initiative is trying to make it a little bit more accessible and easier for yeah, individuals. All we want to get for teachers' jobs to be easier, because when their jobs are easier, they do their jobs and then everyone wins, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I love the example that you just used about the thing do have and talking about it in the book, because at that same time, we're working on comprehension strategies. Yeah. Right. So we're not just working on writing strategies. We're working on comprehension strategies. And especially when we start talking about the more complex sentences and subject verb agreement and a passive voice versus an active voice, that gives that individual the power to understand the text at a deeper level. Absolutely. To know what to look out for, to know that there is a, there are conventions within communication. That is the basis of comprehension. Um, and yet we assume that, ch you know, children somehow know that and, and they don't. You, you need to explain that or, you know, if you explain that, then what you're going to do is you're going to take a larger amount of children along on that journey to literacy. And who would be who could be against that? You know, nobody. right? But, um, yeah, these very logical, um, these very logical points are, are sometimes um, missed. Yeah, because I don't think teacher training is, is adequate. I don't think teachers are being given the correct tools. Of course, I'm definitely in agreement on that. Um, so the other thing that I think is important to introduce to students early on, especially when we're talking about cops, is the fact that we do need to edit our work. There are very, very few people in this world that can write something and have it absolutely perfect the first time they wrote it without any process of revision. I mean, you're talking about the needing to do that in your books and yeah. how it takes time, but we need to allow students to understand from a young age, it's not going to be perfect the first time you do it. Mm. But there are ways, there are paths exactly. to it. You know, I mean, here's the thing, right? If you, if you split the process of writing um, into uh, three sections, yeah. you, you'll find, and it's probably your experience as well, you'll find that there's a section that is heavily weighted, that, that most, um, most of the activity with writing is to do with this bit, right? And the other two, which are equally important, are neglected. So that's planning, mm -hmm. drafting, and editing. The moment you put a blank piece of paper down in front of a child and a stimulus, that is drafting. You've gone straight to drafting, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some children who need a little bit of time to form that draft, therefore never getting the chance to edit. So all you're doing is disabling right? children mm -hmm. when you say, write this, here's your stimulus, write this. Planning is incredibly important, but again, teachers are not given frameworks for writing planning mm -hmm. or they're led to believe that you need to take away those frameworks in order to see how well the children are doing. And there we get drafting again, no time for editing or no tools for editing. You know, mm -hmm. So everything is drafting. Um, and we again, we need to revise that. We need to actually become much more explicit in the, at the planning stage. And that then with that planning stage coupled with the drafting stage is going to make the task of editing so much more of a breeze. And everyone hates editing, right? Editing sucks. When, you, when you've done your draft, the last thing you want to do is go back and look at that thing, right? But if your planning stage is good, it's going to be less painful. And so I think, again, a shift of focus, just small shifts of focus onto planning, yep, will take the burden off the drafting and editing stages. That's my view. It's my opinion, you know, 
could be wrong. Yeah, but I think the important, again, to have that explicit nature allows the students who are on the lower end to realize that the higher achieving students are already doing this. They're but already not seeing it. And we can give the higher achieving students a platform, a, a, you know, a, a, a dive into even higher achievement. Yeah. You can always improve. So none of this is about, oh, let's cater for that, you know, who was it? They, 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 oh gosh, some admin from a balanced literacy group was going on about turning the education system upside down oh, for yeah. this you know, 20% or, or, or whatever it was. Actually, no. When you make it more explicit and provide better frameworks for all of these things, everyone benefits. Yeah. Everyone benefits, you know. And so it is with, with, um, with, with writing, with explicit writing instruction everyone benefits I don't think I'm the best writer I could be um and I read stuff I've, I I wrote 10 years ago and I look at it and go crikey I didn't know how to write back then and I always will I'll always look back on yeah. everything I've written going oh glad I don't write like that anymore what an amateur <laughs> yeah. I'm 51 so you can always do and I'm, and I'm not bad you know I've had some books published and stuff right so you can always improve and so why not give everyone everyone the means to do that yeah well and talking about word choice with your students that are struggling and word choice with students that are at the top of the class it's the same conversation you're just focusing on words at different levels of their vocabulary yeah and giving them the skills and saying okay well let's try rewriting this sentence three different ways that's going to be an effective strategy for all the students in your class to improve their work. All of your students. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about the sentence. Well, unfortunately, sentences aren't just enough. Then we have paragraphs. So what is the, do you feel is a great transition going from just having a couple sentences to formally teaching that paragraph structure? Well, I don't know about a transition. I mean, I can talk about that, but now that we are at the sentence level and mm -hmm. we want to turn that into a response to something that we're learning, mm -hmm. then what we need to be doing in the background of all of that is building knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that again is neglected from the teaching of spelling, the teaching of writing. We get these things called, and I, I've, you know, this is just my name for it, but um, <clears throat> I call them orphan words and orphan sentences. So say in your scope and sequence, right, you're learning about CK. Yeah. And how you can't have that at the beginning of a word. And, you know, you don't tend to get consonants before CK and all that, all the conventions around CK, right? Yeah. That graphene. Um, you can choose example words and use example sentences for the sake of having some CK in there. Or you can go, so what are we studying? Ah, oh, ah, oh, okay. Um, you know, animals. Great. Well, here's an example. Um, <laughs> what's, what's a word of the CK in an animal? I don't even know. Like thick, right? You know, yeah. like sheep has a thick, has a thick coat or whatever. Or the you black sheep. Better, yeah, the black, and there you go. That's <laughs> a better example, right? Than yeah. you know, um, something that's not related to other things that you're studying. Um, milk, right? That's a non example that's got a consonant L before the k sound yeah. at the end. Or you wouldn't use CK and so on. It, you know, why not choose sentences and words that relate to what you're, you're, um, you're learning about? Then what you have in their oral language is already formed sentences, right? Sentences that, and paragraphs and, you know, um, information that has already been rehearsed mm -hmm. to some degree. And that is how you transition, right? From, from sentence work to paragraph work. Of course, there are paragraph frameworks that you can use for different genres mm -hmm. and ways of connecting sentences to one another, you know, using conjunctions and, and that sort of thing. But if you're building knowledge, you're rehearsing, you're already rehearsing those conventions. You're already rehearsing that type of text. So why not? Why not? It takes a bit of extra thought. It takes a bit of extra thought, but again, over time, what that's going to do is just consolidate, consolidate everything that you want to teach so that you're not doing it in a silo. 
you're actually you're, you're, you're forming networks and that indeed is how human communication takes place that's 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 how you know that's how we know stuff that's how we build mental models of how the world works mm -hmm. yeah, we don't we don't learn about one thing in isolation we see how it's connected to all the rest of the universe or we should yeah so should it be for writing that's my recommendation anyway well and i feel um is it important you know when we're having these classroom discussions to make sure that we're writing some of this information on the board or some way that it's recorded, not because there are auditory learners or visual learners. It's not that argument. It's purely going down to cognitive load and working memory. You have students that have poor working memory and processing speed. And by the time they get to the actual written assignment, if it's not written down somewhere there for them to reference, it's gonna be gone. Yeah. Like who, again, back to you, adult. Yeah. When do you not take notes? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're, you're working from notes. Probably you have those target words that you're trying to hit in the lesson to build yeah. the examples. So why are you expecting these little things in front of you with a smaller working memory to begin with? Yeah. Uh, to, to remember them. And yes, there are going to be those lucky few that have it, but give them the strategies, talk about graphic organizers and maybe, you know, before you work on that draft, let's stop, create a plan. What order are you gonna talk things? How can we connect these concepts together? Should we have stuff about what they eat and how they live in the same paragraph? Does that make sense jumping from one to the other? And, you know, that's when we see this stream of consciousness writing. And I think it's important to highlight that because well, yes, it's Sorry. an important process, right? Yeah. And it is definitely that stream of consciousness style of writing. Yeah. But we want to communicate to the student that, well, it's maybe not the most effective way to get your information across because you're jumping from here to there to there to there to there. And it's hard for the reader to follow. Absolutely. Look, a stream of consciousness and, and, and saying that that's acceptable is what I call a quantity approach mm -hmm. of what we want is a quality approach. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, if you just blurt out and a vomit draft everything that's in your head, you're going to fill two sides of your, your paper and then mm -hmm. you can go for your break, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you won't have learned anything about the world and uh, whether you're going to teach anything about how what you think, you know, in terms of the communication that you put down in the paper, you may not have achieved that communicated purpose either. So, uh, and yet it is the norm. It's the norm to go two sides. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. And, and the result of that is, yeah, that stream of consciousness that you're talking about, rather than taking it easy and going for a quant ah, quality, not quantity, going for a quality approach. Yeah. And there's one example that always comes to mind when we're talking about letting students discover writing and be creators and learn the conventions through experience and exposure. So um, my husband went to a private school, which in Canada is one that you, you pay for. And it is typically seen as having a, a more stringent and strict education as towards the public schools where there's the more autonomy among the teachers. And, um, you know, going, he went to a university in a different province. And because of how things were, he had to take an English um, proficiency exam to get in to show that he was proficient in English and writing because he didn't achieve a high enough grade just because the grading requirements were stricter at his school. He gets to university with these students that didn't have to take the test. And he was the one that was editing their papers. Uh, because they didn't understand all the rules that he had been drilled in in school that made his mark lower because he wasn't perfect yeah. because of the standard versus the students that were being creative and learning, but they didn't have that academic standard. And you're seeing this in universities around the world and colleges that making that transition from what was acceptable in high school, mm. post-secondary, it's just like, well, I was getting E's handing like this in in high school. Why am I getting a D in university? Because you don't have that structure and that understanding. And filling papers with fluff. I remember on one of my papers, the teacher actually drew, uh, drew flowers around some of the fluff sentences that I put in just to make the, oh. the, 
the two pages that she wanted. She's like, well, this is kind of useless. I'm like, yeah, but you wanted two pages. Yeah, you wanted quantity. Yeah. Rather than quality. Look, it's low expectations as well. And that abounds in education, these low expectations. Having high expectations over time, again, mm. results in higher value <laughs> of, of linguistic output. I mean, you know, again, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a bit of a no brainer. And here's the other thing. I do a survey when I'm working with teachers and um, because there is an awful lot, an awful lot of preponderance on creative writing and finding your story and telling your story and your voice and everything like that. And that's fine. I'm not opposed to it. Um, however, if that's all you're doing or if that is the majority of what you're doing, I, 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 I beg you to question this. And the survey that I do is how many people in here are published fiction authors? Yeah. And, you know, a hand will go up once in a blue moon and I'll go, okay. And then how many people in here have a tertiary qualification? Um, Cause I work with teachers where you had to submit written work about the things that you were learning and all the hands go up. So in your view, <laughs> right? Given that this always happens, what are you with your creative narrative focus really preparing children for? Because if, if, if you teach them to get better at narratives, they're going to get better at narratives and that's awesome. Yeah. But what's it for? What yeah. for? Yeah. And that's where we need to take more of the STEAM approach to teaching writing, the science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, so that you learn in the arts and the sciences how to write for the term or for yeah. the, the appropriateness. So when you're solving a word problem in mathematics, you know, it's good to parrot the sentence and just not write the answer. So you're saying, you know, if there was a problem about how many apples Jimmy bought and how much change he got, well, Jimmy bought this many apples and received this much change. So you under, the reader understands what you're answering, right? Or when you're giving a definition of a word, you're not just giving the definition and then leaving out the word. This word means, uh, and giving them the strategies to write those more formal sentences. Yeah, it's back to the complete sentence. Mm -hmm. It's back down to written um, communication requires complete sentences for mm -hmm. that communicative purpose to be achieved. Mm -hmm. It's not speech written down. It's a different system. So you got to know it and you got to teach it, unfortunately, to give everybody the best possible chance. Right. So if we're starting with the young ones, we start with that sentence structure at the beginning and teaching them connected writing. Mm -hmm. And then if we're following a nice logical progression, we introduce paragraphs, we introduce a simple essay, yeah. and the various conventions along it. Now, that obviously isn't going to be the case for every student that shows up in your classroom or in your practice. So where do you start when you have a student who's in, you know, grades five, six, seven, or in high school, and, and they're not sure what to do? Where's the best place to start? And I'm pretty you're going to say, sure, you're going to say at the sentence. <laughs> well, not at the sub word level. I mean, the thing is, if they haven't acquired mm -hmm. um, a, a sort of, you know, grade standard uh, ability to write, what's mm -hmm. going on? What's going on underneath the surface? And so you've got to look all the way back down to phonological awareness. You've got to make sure that that's something that they are not struggling with. <laughs> you know, so you've got to you've got to go through all of those pillars yeah. and all of those different areas where it could go wrong because it would be a combination of all of those factors. And that takes high quality assessment. It yeah. takes someone who knows what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And it also takes not just somebody who knows what they're doing, but somebody who knows the limitations of the particular student that's in front of them, because you definitely will have children with developmental disorders that make it extremely difficult for them, not only to form letters on a page, but to formulate written communication to, to both sides of that, you know, um, uh, uh, text generation and transcription mm -hmm. elements within writing, they may struggle from a neurological perspective to do all of that. You need to know who they are. You need yeah. to be able to adjust your expectations for that student. You need to know how they're going to respond to interventions. So 
you know, you start with just getting a very high quality profile. And whether mm -hmm. that's you doing it as the educator or recommending that they have psychological assessment, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's something. And, and, and then again, mediated by working memory and attention. You can have these things measured quite reliably. It's a really, really good idea to try to seek that as well if you have someone who's struggling with the, at, at those higher levels um, with writing. So yeah, that's oh. where I'd start. <laughs> well, that, that's looking at the importance of executive functioning, which is another one of my favorite topics, right? Because we're yeah. looking at, <laughs> really, when it looks, when you're looking at quality writing, you're looking at an individual, the best ones have that golden triad of the three lower level executive functions, right? They have working memory, they have inhibitory control and they have cognitive flexibility. The working memory allows them to hold their thoughts and head. Their inhibitory control keeps them from being distracted and also putting that attention into what they're actually writing. And the cognitive flexibility allows for that editing process to happen. Mm, I love that. I love that. I'm, I'm going to steal that. Sure. It's really good. Cause I don't talk about executive function. It's not, it's, it's sort of outside my remit, even though it, it affects yeah. um, the students that I work with. So I don't talk about it extensively. So um, yeah, I love those three. That's great. Yeah. And so th those form the basis of all of the higher order executive functions and those lower level executive functions really start to turn on in the, you know, the late preschool years right? In kindergarten. So the, the four and five-year-olds are just starting to develop these. And we yeah. see a little bit of a jump in the ability. So, what, you know, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, they're starting to develop these skills to not just write what's in their mind and have that stream of consciousness. And then we have that other jump. Again, this isn't typically developing students in the, you know, preteen, teen stage. So that's where we get, start to see the better quality of writing. Now, of course, just like everything, you see the, the bell curve for the development of executive functions. If we are talking about a neurodiverse individual, there can be a lag of anywhere from, you know, one to three or five years in the development of the executive functions. So if you have a student with attention deficit disorder, a learning disability, anxiety, all of these executive functions are going to be affected. So their written output is going to be affected. We need to provide the strategies and the skills in place for them to be success. And that's where the graphic organizers and the planning comes in. So important. Yeah. Again, I'm just, I hope I, from this recording, what I'm going to do is get a transcript of that. That's just going to go in the book because it's so well put. You're really good at this. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, look, there, there are also, there's also quite a bit of talk in writing about, oh gosh, now SSRD. Oh gosh. I um, hate acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> same. The, the reason I bring it up is because yeah. there are approaches to writing to do with regulation. Yes. Right? And to do with self-regulation and then you can actually explicitly teach that yes. as well i'm really really interested in that area and before yes. i write the book i'm going to make sure that i get as much information on that as possible i think something like self something regulatory oh gosh that's terrible um but it's something that's on my agenda it's something that i need to read and write about more yes. um and so the triple sr um is coming to Australia in July next year. They're going to do a, um, a convention in Australia for the first time. And it's all research on writing. Um, researchers bringing their latest findings and, 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 you know, incredible experts at the neurological level, at the, you know, way above me in mm -hmm. the academic level are coming over here to do that. And that's where uh, I'll be doing my final kind of, okay, what else do I need to know before I write this book? So that's coming up, but self-regulation is a huge part of that, but I don't feel qualified enough to talk about that yet. Watch the get that. Yeah, well, and the other thing, uh, another um, individual that I really wish I had the opportunity to speak to that I feel is was, was a leader in this er area was the late William Van Cleef. And he has amazing resources that are fortunately still available. 
that really go into this in detail. Yep, absolutely. Writing matters, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> And all the other, I mean, you can't separate the other parts from that. That's the thing yeah. about it. So um, yeah, writing is one of those science of learning rabbit holes that you can go down. And William mwah, did it perfectly. And he is, uh, except one thing, right? He said, okay, and we we did, he and I had a good relationship. Yeah. Um, he, 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 he did say that determiners, you know, like the and am are adjectives and they're not. No, they're not. And I was getting very close to convincing him, right, that they're not. So when it says that, I, I'm pretty certain William would have revised that in the next decade or so, just so you know, determine yeah. adjectives. All right. Wonderful. That's it. Everything else is perfect. <laughs> now, the thing that I want to end off with is talking about those students that you, you we kind of lost over is those students with dysgraphia. Can you talk about in your experience what their typical struggles are and how we need to separate them? You can't just look at a student with dysgraphia and say, okay, this is the, this is the intervention for them. Like any of these specific learning disorders, we need to target specific skills and have a deeper understanding of their needs. Mm. and their needs and their specific skills are going to differ from mm -hmm. one another across the dysgraphia diagnosis but yeah. the way I look at it from a very simple point of view and then you can become more detailed as to how you support that individual from a very simple point of view it goes like this simple view of writing transcription text generation dysgraphia struggles with both mm -hmm. right and the various components and there are multiple components within those two areas, those two separate critical processes that are to do with writing. So mm -hmm. with a dysgraphic student, the, um, the diagnosis is formed on the basis of significant struggles in both of those areas. So that's getting the words formed and getting the ideas on the page. Mm -hmm. Whereas your dyslexic students may have fabulous ideas and can get them onto the page, you know, but have difficulty spelling the words or getting the sequence correct and, and, and so on. So they're, they're different profiles. Mm -hmm. So with dysgraphia, what you have to do is basically analyze the profile of the child and work towards that. And having said that, there will be times in many cases of dysgraphia because of the nature of that beast mm -hmm. where assistive technology is really important. It's, it's, it's again, a human right almost yeah. for children who will struggle with this sort of thing, he will make incremental improvements, no matter the quality of the instruction and the inter intervention, the time and the energy that you're putting into that and the kid is putting into that may only result in an incremental rise in their ability to get these words onto the page in a speedy, legible way. So therefore, assistive technology, especially in cases of dysgraphia, is a really important avenue to go down. It's so important, it's like insulin, you know, for yeah. a diabetic child, you actually have to coach them. You have to uh, give them all of the information that they need on why they're doing that, how to do it, you know, why it's important, why it's not cheating, right? And why it doesn't, it's not, they're not dumb, you know, you're just leveling the playing field. Yeah. Um, and so you have to coach them in the use of assistive technology and allow them to form the language that will advocate for themselves. So that again, it's an independence thing. So when they're without you, they can say, I'm doing this because, and I'm very happy with doing this because, not because I'm cheating or dumb, right? Yeah, because this is my insulin, this is my wheelchair, this is my ramp. Yeah. yeah. So it takes a long time and it takes dedication. Um, you can't just hand a C pen over to someone and go, there you go, you're fine now. You know, that, that doesn't You're cured. Happen. Yeah, you're cured. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I have the tools I need to succeed. Hopefully I know how to use them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but one the, thing, sorry. one thing I know a lot of teachers struggle with is when is it appropriate? And the thing that I like to tell them is you need to boil down what the objective for the task is. Yeah. Are you trying to see how well they can form their letters and write? Yeah. Or are you trying to get content and quality? And is that writing going to inhibit their ability to produce the content? Well, yeah. if it is, and it's not what your target of the assessment is, 
then don't make it a requirement for that student. Absolutely. The other thing on that, though, with teachers and, and, and that question, because I hear this a lot and I hear lots of teachers who are incredibly concerned for their students and just want the best for them. Oh, the other thing, in, in, in the case of dyslexia and dysgraphia, it should never have to be just the teacher's decision. It should no. be a global decision made by all the stakeholders yeah. regarding certain paths in certain circumstances. And I think there's an awful lot of pressure on teachers and a lot, a lot on their shoulders where they feel they have to make the decision. Actually, it's it's student, the, the caregivers of the student, people who form the diagnosis in the first place, the system to which you belong as well, because there are different conventions for exams and and, uh, and, and written work being handed in. It's not, you know, a teacher, um, they, they get very, very concerned and very overloaded and overwhelmed with mm. that. Whereas I think it's our job again to sort of say to teachers, hey, we can all work together on this so that it's not, doesn't fall solely on your shoulders. Yeah, and that's where in most places we have individualized education plans or some variation of the thing where there is a group that makes a decision of when this yeah. is appropriate and when it's not and what situations that we're going to use. But highlighting the importance of having the accommodation doesn't take away the need for teaching the skill in another situation. Sure thing. Yeah. And that's where I see so many faults is that schools, whether it's writing or reading, they're like, oh, here's the assistive technology to help support that skill. So we no yeah. longer have to teach you it. And yeah. that's doing a huge disservice for the students. Yeah, and also a huge disservice for the teachers in the end, because what we want to do is build teacher capacity so that they have a really deep well of experience and understanding to draw from. Mm -hmm. um, if, we, if we just say, yeah, there's an app for that now, then we're denying them, um, you know, the, the, uh, the ability to look further under the bonnet if you like, of, of that system as well, so that it can be adapted for everyone. So yeah, we're, you know, if, if we're lazy about it, and I do, when I say lazy, I just mean, this is not a place to cut corners. Yeah. Reading and writing is not somewhere that you cut corners. It, nobody, nobody benefits from that. No one, <laughs> no one in the whole system. And yet it's very tempting to go, hey, I'm a school principal, you know, I just ordered 20 C pens, all the dyslexics are fixed, woo! And yeah. now we can get back to discovering our way to some knowledge or other. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And realizing that things like predictive text or when you're writing, it has uh, you know, on your phone, it's like, oh, this is, this word should probably fit in. Yeah. They're gonna be kids that, that can't read that word, don't know what it means, but because it was predictive, they're like, okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's a very strong element of fallibility in yeah. all of this. If you take a human out, then what yeah. you have is a very, very strong fallibility factor. Um, and uh, I think that needs to be, uh, that goes under acknowledged from time to time too. Okay, well, before we wrap up, are there any things that you think we missed that we definitely need to address when we're talking about your thoughts about writing? No, I think we've covered a lot and actually I've learned a bit as well, which I really, that's my favorite sort of interview. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Lynn. I know all of us in Canada are looking forward to your journey over where you're going to do some professional development for us. And if you are wanting to know about those dates in October of 2022, please refer to Lynn Stone's website. And uh, yeah, there's some amazing opportunities there. Thank so, you. Always a pleasure, Catherine. <laughs>